Welcome to 22nd and the last Phoenix Infrastructure webinar. Uh, today, we are, we are talk about Phoenix Federated Services and uh, Martin Lyshevsky from JSC and Bjorn Hogmeier from JSC2, Fabio Picari Sineca, Michel Catene, and Alex Olsen from ETA will be our speakers. Only to remember you that the webinar will be reco being recorded. Uh, if you want to know more information about Phoenix, uh, we can access the Phoenix website. And if you want to access uh, the older webinar section, so we have all, the, all, all of them available on the Phoenix website too. And if you want to know more about the Phoenix white paper, which we launched uh, in the first uh, semester of this year, we can find it um, on the Phoenix website too, with all lessons learned in HPT service providing. Uh, at the end of this session, the, this section, we will have a QA um, where you can use the QA options to make your questions. So, Alex, I'll pass the mic to you. Okay, so hopefully you can all hear me and see my screen. Yes. Great. So, okay, so I'll make a start then. So, firstly, thank you everyone for joining. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to talk briefly about the Phoenix, let's say, federated services. We're also going to have a, a short demo of selected services, namely the data mover. Phoenix user resource management uh, system, Phoenix AI, and then finally the Chineke interactive compute service. And then as mentioned also at the beginning, at the end, we'll also have a short time for Q&A. So in case you have any questions that you would like to ask, uh, ask the panelists, then yeah, we have a, a short space of time then at the end. Okay, so I'll make a start. So just to give a brief overview then of the Phoenix services. So as you may be aware, there was um, actually, just at the end of last month, the IC Phoenix project uh, finished. And in the context of this project, a number of federated services were developed and deployed at five leading HPC sites across Europe. Uh, these sites being Barcelona Supercomputer Center in Spain, SCEA in France, Chinec in Italy, uh, JSC in Germany, and also CSCS in Switzerland, which is actually where I work. Um, then we should also note that really these services, they laid the foundations for offering federated compute services to the European research community. And we have the prime example from this of the neuroscience community in Europe that was supported very heavily by the ICHPB core. They were able to make use of these services. And in more specifically then in this webinar, we're then gonna showcase four of these services. So we're gonna look at the data mover service, Phoenix AI, Phoenix User Resource Management System service, and finally, the Chineca Interactive Compute Service. So let's start with the Data Mover service. And um, I thought rather than me trying to explain it, I thought it would be better actually if we showed a video that had been prepared by, um, by Martin, who's actually been overseeing the development of this service. So let's, let's play and let's have a look at what he has to say. Hi, everyone. My name is Martin Lyshevsky. I am a storage engineer at the Uli Supercomputing Center, and today I want to present to you the Data Mover service. The Data Mover is an ICI funded development project. We developed the software in cooperation with two companies named MTC and Aquinet. They already had an existing Data Mover called Nodeum, which they then extended with the feature we requested. We, as a JSC, were the leading contractor for the project but the software is meant to be run on all five ECI sites. The objective of the software is to move data site locally from an active data repository to an archival data repository and backwards. The active data repositories are represented by the local HPC file systems and the archival data repositories are represented by the cloud-based object stores. I want to highlight some main attributes. The service is programmable and can be extended by multiple plugins or even scripts written by the user. As we are talking about a large number of inodes and terabytes of data, the movement is parallelized and offers a high speed. All data movements are secured and the whole service is scalable. The same software is running on all sites, which for the user brings the same experience and interface. We even included the Phoenix AI, 
which means every Phoenix user can access the servers and authenticate themselves. The data mover offers multiple interfaces such as the REST API, but the main interface used in this project is the Bash client. Also, we integrated the service into Slurp, which means you can schedule your data movements depending on a running job, for example, to stage in or stage out your data. Now I would like to demonstrate the usage of the data mover to you. I switched to a terminal and logged in with my user ID named Lyshevsky1 on our client system named UDAC. Here the bash client called ND is available for every user. By typing just ND, I'm calling this named bash client. The first string we could try to do is listing all recent tasks. Therefore, I'm just typing task list and now the ND client requests me to authenticate myself. Therefore, I need to click on this link and enter this code. The given URL forwards me to this website. Here I have to paste the code we saw in the terminal. Afterwards, I click on verify. Now I have to choose the IDP where I want to authenticate myself. As I'm coming from JSC, I just type in JSC and click in the drop down menu on my IDP. With that, I get redirected to our Unity and use my credentials to log in. If you see this window, the authentication was successful and you can close the window and return to the terminal. Being back at the terminal, the ND client noticed that I'm authenticated and we see a list of all past tasks. This authentication step needs only be done once. And from now on, every time I use the ND client, I can use it directly without visiting the Phoenix website. Now I want to give you an example on how to really move data using the ND client. I want to move data from our file system large data 2 to our object store. Here I copied the command which I need to execute. First of all, the ND client. Then we choose which operation we want to do. In this case, I chose a copy command. There are multiple options I could choose. For example, I could also just move the data. The next parameter chooses which project I want to use. In this case, I'm using the project named storage test data. Also, I have to define the source of the movement. Which file do I want to move? In this case, I want to move the file myfile.txt, which is stored in large data 2, and it's stored directly in the project directory named storage test data. The last parameter represents the destination. Where do I want to move my data to? I want to move the data to the object store. And where should it be stored? In a new container named Martin's container. By pressing enter, the command gets executed and now we see a loading bar, which shows the progress of the movement. The movement itself is now not done on the UDAC itself, but on a dedicated data mover cluster, which is specially used for the movement. Afterwards, you see the summary, which shows that one file has been successfully moved from the large data to the object store. Obviously, this is a very simplistic example of the service. There are a lot more options. For example, you can move whole directory structures at the same time. All the options and possibilities of the service are documented on our wiki page of UDAC. If you now are interested, you can follow this link. Feel free to test the service Great, so that was just a pre-recorded demo that hopefully gave you a nice overview of the data mover service. Um, just again, to emphasize that in case you do have any questions about this, um, you feel free to answer them later because uh, Martin was actually here as one of the panelists. Hi everyone. So now let's look at the Phoenix AI. So as you might've noticed already, the Phoenix AI was already mentioned um, as it was integrated with the data mover as an authentication mechanism. And in essence, the Phoenix AI provides users with the seamless access to the services and resources that are made available by the Phoenix infrastructure. So for example, here we saw already with the data mover. It also has the ability that it supports different levels of assurance. 
So that means according to how much you trust and also the origin of the federated identity providers. And again, I should also mention in, in addition to the data mover integration that we already saw, it's already also integrated with the Phoenix uh, user resource management service firms and also with the interactive compute demos. And now actually in the next demo, four firms, we're actually gonna see that as well. So here we go. Today, we're going to present firms, the Phoenix user and resource management system. Firms is connected to the Phoenix authentication and authorization infrastructure, so we can log in with the support of any of the participating sites or via the eBrains platform. Upon login, we get to choose from one of our assigned roles. For the purpose of this demo, I have multiple roles. As an administrator of the JSC site, I can manage policy documents, services, resource types, and I can add resource credits of an already existing type to the Federation and distribute the credits to the communities and projects. We will now create a resource at the JSC site to make it available to Phoenix. Phoenix will in turn make it available to the demo community, where community administrators can distribute it to projects. Fully distributed resources will not be displayed in dashboards by default. When managing resource allocations for projects, I can either allocate resources starting from the community dashboard or use the project allocations view. We'll allocate 50 units, and because it is available at the JSC site, we have another entry in the list of allocations. Now going to the Project Administrator view, uh, I can make myself an ordinary user of the project and grant myself access. But before doing so, I would like to show how this access to the resources reflects um, at the local site. For this purpose, we open a console on the HPC system and check the locally available resources with the JUtil tool. I currently only have access to the IC Demo uh, 01 project and no access to any CPU quota for the IC Demo 2 project. Now, granting access to the resources. We immediately have this access at the site, which will eventually also reflect in the resource access view of the project as can be seen by refreshing the status of the allocation. Okay, so there we had a, a nice overview of firms. Yeah. Uh, 
technical hiccup <laughs> accepted. And again, as per for the data mover, if you have any questions you uh, would like to ask about firms, then uh, Bjorn is actually here available as, as a panelist. And so you can ask in the Q&A after. So now let's go to the next um, demo. So now we can have a look at the uh, interactive compute service from Chineka. Um, as before, we have a video demo that now I'm going to play. Hello everyone, I'm Fabio Pitari from Chineka, and I'm going to show you a very quick demo about the interactive computing service, uh, which is currently up and running uh, at Sinaga. The service has been deployed uh, for all the Phoenix Research Infrastructure Partners thank thanks to the ACI project. And, uh, and it has been uh, uh, developed and deployed mainly by the economic operator, which uh, in this case is uh, E4 company, and in particular uh, their division E4 Analytics. The web page that you see here is the portal from which the user can connect to the service. This is running on a virtual machine on another cloud environment and it inter interacts directly with the compute nodes on which the server for the service will be spawned. So the user can access to the web page through the web address jupyter.g100.sineca.it. Currently, every user with an active account on Galileo 100 can connect to the service by clicking on this button and using the uh, Cineca Identity Provider. Actually, we are going to put in production also the Phoenix Identity Provider, and I'm going to show it here in our development environment, in which the user will, they will be able to choose between two different identity providers. So using the Phoenix Identity Provider, they will be asked to connect with their own identity provider and they will put their own credential in order to have access to the system. Here you can see that you can have also the same result by clicking the Sineca identity provider from the production environment. After the login phase, uh, the user will be prompted with a form and in this form he will be uh, allowed to choose a set of uh, uh, resources that will be allocated uh, for him on the cluster. Uh, a job will start on a dedicated uh, partition uh, on the cluster on which the service is running and uh, um, you, uh, the user will be able to understand the status of the queues here from a uh, ad hoc uh, table uh, that displays the availability of the resources and the user will be able also to click on a user guide uh, key in order to understand uh, how to use the tool. After this phase the user will be uh, uh, able to submit a job here and in this job uh, um, an interface will be uh, prompted to the user and uh, he will be able to use the service uh, on the compute nodes directly from the browser. This is the uh, default web interface that is shown to the user as soon as it connects. So all these environments that you see here are either uh, Python environments or Jupyter features or additional features that has been added by Sineca uh, and the economic operator in order to extend the basic feature of Jupyter. Everything is running currently on the compute nodes and is spawned inside my web browser. So here you can see that there are a few default environments which are uh, based on most of the most common use cases which are currently run on, uh, on inside the scientific uh, community. But there are also additional features like C++ kernel, which are compatible also with the C kernel. And a specific environment for specific scientific fields like uh, 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 computational chemistry. And uh, many of these environment actually targets uh, AI workflow, which uh, uh, fits perfectly with respect to the service, uh, which is uh, uh, running an interactive interface uh, via web browser through uh, using GPUs. 
Besides this function, the user uh, is also allowed to use some basic uh, Jupyter uh, features, like for instance, uh, an in-browser terminal from which he can, uh, you can see that uh, the user is actually uh, connected to a, uh, a computer nodes provided with GPUs. And uh, uh, additional features from features provided with the H4SPC suite, like for instance, the Visual Studio Code interface, which is spawned directly inside the browser in order to allow the user to have a IDE uh, that he can uh, use uh, very easily uh, with the, the, his own code in order to uh, modify, for instance, uh, his uh, codes for the workflow that he wants to maybe run uh, for uh, uh, with the C++ scanner provided with the interface. Here, for instance, I'm going to show you a very nice use case using PyTorch, which is going to run via web browser on the compute nodes by uh, using the GPUs allocated on the compute nodes. So you here you can see that the notebook is running, and it is going to uh, do uh, some uh, image reconstruction use case. So here you will see that the computation is running and uh, as long as the output is going on, we can actually monitor the usage of the GPU and the resources by using a specific plugin here, which is uh, uh, studying, uh, uh, which is exploiting the usage of the machine resources. In particular, this can be useful for the GPU utilization in order to understand how many GPUs are used here. In this case, I'm using just one GPU. And here you can see that the GPU memory uh, is, is displayed and plotted specifically. So here you can see the GPU resources uh, and the behavior of the resources in order to understand also if some bottlenecks can be identified in the workflow. And this can be done in real time, just executing uh, the workflow. Another interesting feature that has been implemented inside the service is the possibility to submit batch jobs on the um, queues of the cluster uh, directly from the web interface. And this has been uh, done by implementing a plugin developed at Nest, uh, which is called Sklurm Queue Manager, from which we can take just a simple uh, submit jobs and uh, uh, submit it from a specific web page, uh, from which we can also uh, monitor the state of the queue or the job notification from uh, the slum scheduler. And you can also submit a job by uh, uh, writing the content of a, a slum script directly from the web interface. So in conclusion, the interactive copy service provided the user of uh, Phoenix research infrastructure with a uh, very flexible tool in order to access uh, quickly and uh, interactively with the computational resources provided by the project. And we are going to expand uh, such service uh, with the additional tools together with the E4 company and E4 Analytics, uh, providing the user also with uh, um, a VNC interface, an RStudio interface, and with Julia Kernels. Great, so that hopefully provided you also with a nice overview of some of the functionality of the Chineco Interactive Compute Service. And yeah, have you already showed a couple of nice options, particularly you saw the Slurm Queue Manager, also the AI workflow. Um, so yeah, some very powerful stuff there. And also, again, you saw the integration with the Phoenix AI as an authentication mechanism, which was also shown as, um, as you know, as a login, uh, login mechanism. So now, actually, um, we we hope that uh, this and also the other uh, demos provided you with a nice, concise overview of some of the Phoenix Federated services, showing you how it did, how they integrated with the uh, Phoenix AI authentication, and also the functionality of what they can provide to you as a user. Now, what I would also like to reiterate, as I was also said at the end of each of these uh, demo videos, that the panelists are actually here today. So if you would like to ask them any questions in particular about the services you've seen, then you're please, yeah, very welcome to ask them now. Also, what I'm gonna do is now stop sharing my screen 
So we can also monitor a bit the, the Q&A and you should also see here, you have the Q&A tab. So yes, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please put it here. Actually, one question um, that actually came from before. Uh, so someone who asked me already that um, when we, if we look at the data mover, uh, Martin, you showed a sort of a toy example with a very small file size. Um, is there a limit to the file size or can any any uh, size file be moved using it? So um, we especially uh, developed the data mover to move also, uh, let's say, big data or a huge amount of data. We do, still don't have any performance testing uh, uh -huh. uh, it, but there's no particular, uh, uh, um, no particular uh, um, limit of of uh, size of, of a file. Um, I'm not quite sure if we have something, some file limit uh, at the implementation of the object store itself, but um, not. I'm not aware of any limitation um, in the data mover. Okay, great. So good. Um, and then also another question that came from before uh, regarding firms. So I saw that uh, Bjorn in the demo you showed a sort of a Euro HPC logo. Um, am I correct in understanding then that one of the functionality, let's say, of firms is that you can then customize it, say, per research community? Right. That's that's the intention exactly. You can you can put in as we did for um, the human brain or uh, the praise communities that we support. You can put the logos in there mm -hmm. um, if if you wanted to 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 make it you know more. Uh, appealing to the users from this particular community such that they feel somewhat at home uh, in there. Okay, great. So yeah, that was, again, uh, thank you for answering those. Um, I'm just having a look now in case there's any other questions coming in on the Q&A. Um, at the moment, I don't see anything in addition. No, so if not, then yep, hopefully that means that it was all, all very clear what was shown in the demos. Um, again, to reiterate that, yeah, we're obviously interested as well in your feedback. So if you would like to use those services, hopefully this also gave you enough of input to start using them. And yeah, you're more than welcome to also then come back to us with any feedback you have about them and, and so on and so forth. So I guess with that, I'll hand back over to Luciana, I guess from my side. I'd like to thank the, the panelists uh, for providing the demos, uh, also for answering the questions. And yeah, I'm back to Charlie. Okay, thank you very much for all of you. Let me share once again my screen. Uh, uh, we will you receive uh, a survey on your email, please. Uh, if you can take a minute to respond to it, it will help us to identify what your needs. And uh, thank you very much for all of you. Thank you, uh, Alex, for moderating the session. And if you want to reach us out, please uh, send us an email, send a message by Phoenix website or social media. And I think is all. Thank you very much.